Right. So I'm going to be continuing. I started a series last week on, uh, on taking heed. And I want, I want you to keep your bookmarker there in Exodus 32. We're going to come back to that a little bit later in the sermon. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And last week I preached a sermon that I pulled from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 was our main passage last week. And um, verse number 12, 1 Corinthians 10 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There's lots of places that we need to be taking heed to, you know, lest we fall. And so I, I decided to preach a series on taking heed. And, I, and what I did, I did a Bible study just looking up all the times where the Bible says, you know, hey, take heed. Because what does it mean to take heed? It's like, hey, beware, watch out, t pay attention to this and make notice and take heed to yourselves. And when, when, you know, obviously all of God's word is important, but if God is stressing a, a certain area and saying, hey, take heed to this, you know, perk up your ears, pay attention, listen up, this is important. This is what we're going to be focusing on for the next coming weeks, the various subjects that are brought up in Scripture when it comes to the Bible saying, hey, take heed to this. Take heed to yourselves that you don't do this or don't do that. Last week I preached on just the importance, the overall importance of God's law because that was a big thing that, that was brought up multiple times about taking heed to God's commandments, taking heed to God's laws, that they are important. And what I'm going to be preaching on this evening is on taking heed about idolatry. Now, when I did my Bible study, this there's a reason why, and these, these words of taking heed are stated more often in regards to idolatry than anything else, than any other subject, than any other thing that he tells you to take heed about. This is a very important thing. You're in Deuteronomy chapter 4, look down at verse number 15. We're going to blow through a lot of these verses, but I just want you to see this how many times this comes up where he's saying, hey, take heed, take heed, take heed, because you don't normally, you know, read your Bible like this, but that's why I did this extra study, so you could see it just over and over and over again. Hey, we better pay attention to this and make sure we understand this concept and understand why it really is so important, because today, people think idolatry, you're like, I'm not going to go worship some golden calf or something. You know what I mean? Like, it almost sounds silly or ridiculous to think that anyone's going to be bowing down to some idol or graven image and stuff. But you know what? It, it happens all over the place. I mean, it happens in the Catholic Church. And I believe it goes even beyond just a little object. But I'm going to get into that a little bit later. We're, I'm going to, you know, we're going to make more applications so that we fully can comprehend and understand idolatry and how serious it is and how it's rooted in the heart of man. Look at verse number 15 here in Deuteronomy chapter 4. The Bible says, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. This is referring back to when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and God was on the mount, right? And there was this big cloud and the people came to the mount and they could hear the voice of the Lord and they were scared, right? And he's saying, take heed because look, you know that when you went to that mountain, you didn't see any similitude or any shape or any figure, right? They didn't, they didn't see like, you know, a person or an object or an animal or anything like that. And he's saying it's for good reason because I don't want you making images unto God so they can see God. You know, the Bible says no man has seen God at any time, right? There's a reason for that. Because God didn't want us making images and, and, and worshiping some creation as opposed to just worshiping God and worshiping God in spirit. So look at verse number 16. He says, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So he's saying, you know, there's a reason why you didn't see anything. There's a reason why you didn't see any images. It's because I don't want you to, to, to build, make any idols, and you start worshiping, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, just, just anything. And you start worshiping anything and everything, and just making gods out of whatever. And that's why he said, take heed. Pay attention. Jump down to verse number 23. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image. It's reiterated in the same chapter. 
He just said, take heed. Now he's saying again, verse 23, take heed unto yourselves. Don't forget the covenant. Don't forget God's word, which he made with you and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And take note of that jealous God. We're going to get back to that in just a minute. Because this is one of the primary reasons why the first two commandments, and we're going to get into that as well in Exodus 20, is not to make, you know, not to have any gods before God and not to have any graven images. Because God's a jealous God. And he wants your affection, your love, your attention, everything devoted to him and not to any other so-called God. Uh, flip forward, if you would, to chapter 11, Deuteronomy 11. Deuteronomy 11, 16. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Again, take heed. Pay attention. Listen up. Take heed to yourselves. Verse 17. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Chapter 12. Flip over to chapter 12. Deuteronomy 12. Verse number 29. The Bible says, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whether thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself, that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their God, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. And pay attention. Don't start getting ideas from the way that these heathen people worship their gods. And he, he says, why? He says, because they did all these abominable things. Why would you take anything from the way that they worship their false gods at all? Don't, don't look at what they do. Don't try to incorporate the way that they worship their gods in any way, shape, or form. He said, I'm going to tell you how to worship me. You listen to my words. Don't add anything to it. Don't remove anything from it. Just do what I say. And that's it. And that's enough. Because they're, they're wicked. They've done every abominable work. They've even, they even sacrificed their own babies. He's like, why, why would you want to incorporate something from a religion where people are sacrificing their own children and murdering their own children? Yeah, that sounds like something good. Let's incorporate that into Christianity. Let's, let's use that in, in how we worship our God. No. That's blasphemous. I mean, that, that's bringing the name of God down. That's making his image not holy when you make when you start worshiping God the way that the heathen does. Exodus chapter twenty. Turn if you would to Exodus chapter twenty. This is where one of the, one of the passages where we see the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter twenty. So we've seen multiple times already just in Deuteronomy. Hey, take heed, take heed, take heed. Don't don't make yourself these graven images. And every time it's don't do this because when you do. There's going to be a great punishment. God's going to come against you. There's going to be wrath against you. There's going to be problems. You're going to be cursed. You're going to have all these problems coming against you when, you when you put up these idols, when you turn from the Lord and serve idols. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse number 2. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So look, I am the Lord. I'm the one that did it. I'm the one that saved you. I'm the one that, that, that freed you from your enslavement. So you don't have any other God before me. I am the Lord. I am the God. I am your Savior. Verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee. And that's commandment number one. No other gods. There's one Savior. There's one Lord. There's one God. Amen. And that is who we worship and that's who we serve. And we're not going to go off into any other God or gods or anything else. Or say we could become gods. Doesn't, no, none of it. Verse number four, commandment number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth 
generation of them that hate me and showing mercy on the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So we see a little bit more detail now. He's talking about, hey, and don't make yourselves any graven images. Don't, don't make images of birds or fish or anything on the earth. You know, basically, he says, you know, heaven, earth, sea, none of it. Don't go making yourself these images of any of God's creation to just start bowing down and worshiping one of God's creations. You say, who would do that? The Hindus do that. The Catholics do that. Other religions do. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of religions that still to this day have images that are erected, that are set up, images of beasts, images of birds, images of whatever, and people worship it. Now, I have yet to see a Christian actually bow down and start worshiping, you know, the dove or the fish, but you're one step away from that. Why, I, you know, I don't know why people have to come up with these symbols of Christianity that are literally like these graven images. People put them on the backs of their cars and stuff, these fish and, and, the, and the doves. When the Bible says, look, don't even make this stuff. Don't make these images. And don't bow down to them. We ought not to have any of that stuff. Let's stay far. When you, when, by the time we get done with this sermon and you see how serious idolatry is, we ought to be not even anywhere close to you. Whether or not you agree with me that I believe that is idolatry to be putting that stuff up and putting these images up and say, oh, well, it's representative of Jesus or whatever. Look, we don't need a symbol. We don't need a bird. We don't need a fish. We don't need any animal or any piece of God's creation to symbolize Jesus Christ in some molten image form right. at all. Let's just use God's word and let's just describe Jesus for who he is. We don't need to go around and, and start using these icons to, to be an image of God. Or represent our God. Because you can't represent God with a fish. You can't represent God with a bird. That's bringing down who God is. Right. But even if you don't agree with me on that, by the time we get through this, you're going to see how serious idolatry is. Why would you even want to step close to that? Why would you even want to get close to that line of making something that might be considered an idol? Even if you're not bowing down and worshiping it. We ought to be careful about this. And, and notice it says there in verse number four, he says, uh, or verse number five, thou shalt not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. We see that again. He's a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. When people reject God, because that's what he says, the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Those that hate the Lord. And keep this in mind too. This is all going to be very important. It's all going to play in and I don't have time to really tie everything together. People that reject the Lord make gods unto themselves. They hate God and create their own gods. And this is something that we see. It's extremely serious. We're going to get into the reprobate doctrine a little bit tonight because it all ties together. All of it is associated. All of it is linked together. And it might be a little bit deeper study tonight, but try to stay with me and try to, try to, you know, I'm trying to point these out the best I can. He mentions in the same uh, commandment to not make graven images, to not create idols, to not bow down and worship them. He brings up people that hate God. And he's saying, I'm going to visit the iniquity of the fathers under the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So this, this act of idolatry and people rejecting God and hating God, that curse comes on their own family, their own line for three or four generations. It's a very, very, I mean, think about that alone should show you how serious God is about this sin. What other sin is he talking about going for just generations where it's going to be a problem? You're going to be cursing your children for generations to come when you get involved in this. That is serious. And like I said, take heed is mentioned more often than any other subject of the Bible about idolatry. Exodus 34. Go, if you would, to, ch to chapter 34. Chapter 34, verse number 12. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. This is an important attribute to understand about God. We live in a world today where people want to say how bad jealousy is. And they want to tear people down. Oh, you have a jealous husband or you have a jealous wife. And they want to make that sound so bad and so horrible. And it's not. 
I'll tell you what, jealousy is an attribute of God. Now, first of all, we need to just be clear because in today's culture, today's language, sometimes people have a, um, a misunderstanding of what jealousy is. They think that jealousy is envy. They're two different things. Being envious of something that someone else has is like covetousness. That is not the same as jealousy. Definitely not the way that the Bible uses the word. Jealousy is being jealous over something that belongs to you, not something that belongs to someone else. It's something that you have that belongs to you that you don't want anyone else to have, that no one else should have their affection towards that thing. And typically, we use jealousy in regards to relationships, right? Husbands and wives. I don't want any other man looking at or lusting after my wife or anything like that. Why? Because I'm a jealous husband because she belongs to me. Because she is for my eyes only. She is someone that's only to be held with me. You know, the, the relationship that we have is only belongs to us because we are married to each other. And you better believe I'm a jealous husband. And no one else ought to be setting their affections on her the way that I do. And vice versa. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that because that's how God is. That's why he doesn't want anyone making idols. Because they say, no, I'm God. You don't go after any other gods. You don't put your love and devotion and sacrifices and altars onto any other gods. I'm the God. I made you. I made this earth. I made everything. I'm the one that gives you life. I'm the one that gives you breath. I'm the one that gives you food. Your affection belongs to me. That's God's attitude. And when you start you know, going a whoring off after other gods, and coming up with your own gods and going after these false devils that are called gods, that makes God angry. Very angry, just as much as it would make me angry if my wife just started going whoring around with other guys. That would make me really angry. Yep. And it ought to. But we live in a society that is trying to make adultery normal, fornication normal. And they're trying to make all this stuff okay and say, no, no, you're the one that has a problem because you're a jealous husband. No, I'm not the one that has a problem. And just as much as, as we're going to see we want to avoid idolatry at all costs, we're going to avoid adultery. We're going to avoid that mess at all costs within my marriage, which is why I don't allow my wife to get buddy-buddy with uh, you know, people of the other gender. Why? Because we're going to stay as far away from that as possible. Just as much as we're not going to be having graven images set up in our house either or in this church. Why? Because it's serious. Because God's a jealous God. We see that, that mention, that attribute mentioned over and over. I mean, he, he went as far as to say, whose name is Jealous. Do you know how jealous God is? His name is Jealous. Just like people say, you know, like, like Danger's my middle name, right? You want to know how dangerous I am? Danger's my middle name. Well, you know what God's middle name is? Jealous. That's how jealous he is. He's jealous. Verse number 15, Exodus 34, 15 lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods. See, he, he ties us in, talking about whoring after them. The same way that, it, that you know, a man or woman might go whoring after some other partner. God's using the same terminology of God going whoring after other gods. And they go whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice and thou take of their daughters and unto thy sons and their daughters go a whoring after their gods and make thy sons go whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. God doesn't want anything to do with it. He wants it all. Stem. And that's why when he, when he sent the children of Israel in to the land of Canaan, and they destroyed these cities, and they destroyed these people, they were supposed to utterly abolish and wipe them all out. And their, their altars, and their gods, and their groves, and everything else that they used to worship their gods were supposed to be stamped to powder and just have nothing remaining so that people didn't get these ideas in their head. Hey, I got an idea. Let's build a high place. Let's build a grove unto the Lord. I mean, we're going through the books of 1 and 2 Kings. We've been doing that on Wednesday night for a long time now, and we've been seeing the ramifications. God laid it out clearly in his word because he knows what people do, and he knows the human heart, and he knows what people end up doing. That's why he commanded them to do one thing, but when they disobeyed, it plagued them through their entire kingdom, all the way up until they were taken captive. It was a plague because they didn't utterly destroy the, abominate, the abominable heathen that were before them. And they allowed them then to, to 
worship God the way that they worship their, Lord, their God. Now, they were still you know, worshiping the Lord in some cases, but they were doing it the wrong way, in a way that wasn't pleasing unto God. Uh, go back, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Well, actually, you know what? Don't go to... Uh, Go to Joshua 24. I don't want to belabor this point. There's, in Deuteronomy 5, we basically have you know, the, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, you know, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Again, talking about he's jealous. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we see... Um, Verse 4, this is a famous hero, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And this is what Jesus quotes when, when he was asked, you know, what is the great commandment? And he responds, that hero, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And he goes on and on about, you know, when thou sittest in thine house, walkest by the way, liest down, risest up, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware. Then beware. Same as take heed. Watch out. When everything's going good, when you've been blessed, when you've received this, this great land, you didn't even have to work for it. God just gave you all of this stuff. He says, watch out. Beware. Lest thou forget the Lord. Because why? When things are going good, it's really easy to forget God. It's really easy to say, hey, everything's going really good. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't, you know, everything's going great. I'm just going to continue off having fun and getting wrapped up now in all the cares of this world because things are going so well. It's usually people who are having hard times and problems that get themselves humble and are seeking God because no one else can help them. They can't help themselves. I need to look to God for, for help. And that's human nature too. It's, you know, and, and thank God that we have, you know, that many people do humble themselves after they're brought low and will seek God. But we ought to be maintaining our relationship with God and seeking God the whole time, whether things are going good or bad. And when everything's going well, he says, beware, take heed. Don't forget the Lord your God because that's when you're going to be a lot more likely to just come up with your own concepts and come up with your own gods and just serve God however you want and not consider or care about the Lord and his words. It says, Beware lest thou forget which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Joshua 24, verse number 19 the Bible says, And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. Again, the warning about God, one, being a jealous God, and two, when you forsake God, you serve strange gods, he's going to turn, he's going to do your hurt, he's going to consume you in his wrath because you've forsaken the Lord. Go back, if you would, now to Exodus 32 where we started reading. Exodus 32 is actually a story that was referenced in 1 Corinthians 10. So 1 Corinthians 10, I'm going to reread for you about the, you know, taking heed. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. This is talking about this list of things that's given in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. He said, all these stories in the Old Testament that, you, that you're reading about, 
It's for your admonition. Let's learn from this. He said, take heed. Look at all these stories and take heed lest he fall. And one of those things that was mentioned in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 10 is, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That, that reference there, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play is what we see in Exodus chapter 32. We read the whole story before church started, but let's get into this again. Look at verse number one. Exodus 32, verse number one. The Bible says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So there's our, our quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, what's interesting about this is this is the point when Moses is receiving the word of God. He's up in the mountain. He's receiving not only the Ten Commandments, but other commandments as well. He's up there. He's, he's about to come down with the tablets, with the Ten Commandments. And the people have already been brought out of Egypt. They cross the sea, right? They, they, they've seen the waters come up on either side. They cross on dry land. They saw the, the, the armies of Egypt Get, get toppled and get destroyed. They saw the fire by night and the cloud by day. They were protected. They got the, the, the water in the wilderness and they were fed with manna. They see these things. And Moses is still up in the mountain like, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. Why don't you just make us some gods? Just, just make us some gods. We need some God to follow. Now, I don't believe that these people honestly thought that the gold that came out of their ears and this image that came out of the fire and this calf that was made, that they really thought that, wow, this is some spiritual being of God that created everything. Because that's ridiculous. I think this is showing a little bit more than just that. Now, what it's showing to me is that this is, these are people that didn't care about God. They didn't care about the truth or the real God. They wanted their own God. Because you know what? When Moses comes down, they're going to tell him what God wants. But when they have a made-up God, you can make up how to worship him however you want to worship him. That's why it says, hey, Aaron made an altar. They sat down to eat. They rose up to play. Let's just do whatever. We don't need any rules from God because we've made up our own God. That way we can still pretend to be spiritual and say, you know, and say we believe in God, but we could make up our own morality. We can make up what's right. We can make up what's wrong because who's going to say anything different? We've made up our own God. And you know what? That's what idolatry is. And I don't believe you even have to necessarily have a physical object. Now, a physical object is definitely idolatry. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. And God said not to do that. But the way that I believe this can apply to us today goes beyond just an actual image. I mean, don't have the image. Don't get me wrong. Okay, I'm not saying it's not, you know, the image is, is definitely idolatry. But we need to beware and people need to beware. You know, obviously we're saved, we can't lose our salvation, but people need to be aware. You can't just go and make up your own gods and reject the one true God 
and just make up your own gods because that's going to be devastating for you and for generations to come because this is a very, very serious sin. So we see this. This is what happens. Moses is going to then come down. He's going to see this, and we're going to see the repercussions. We're going to see how angry God gets as a result of this. And when, and when it says, by the way, you know, the Bible is not, is not a, a filthy book by any, by any stretch. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is true. This is a wholesome book. Any child, any, any age person can read this book and not be defiled whatsoever because God's words are pure. And he doesn't go into too much detail when it doesn't need too much detail. But when it says here that they, they, um, they sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play, they're committing fornication. They're doing whatever felt good, right? Let's indulge in food. Let's indulge in play. Let's, you know, let's just do whatever feels good. And that's the God they made for themselves. Verse number seven, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. See, this is God's response. He says, you know what? Let me alone, Moses, because that, my, that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them. Remember, we saw that word consume before about God being a jealous God, about people bringing up, you know, going after other gods and worshiping idols and, and forsaking the Lord and making up their own gods and just doing whatever. God wants to consume these people. And he says, and I will make of thee. He's like, you know, I'll start all over. We'll start from scratch. You can be the great nation. I'll do it through you, Moses. But I'm gonna, I want to destroy these people. But then, of course, Moses intercedes. He intercedes to God. He's like, God, you know, don't do this. You know, give him a chance, whatever. And then jump down to verse number 17. So now Moses is coming down from the mount. And it says, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. So they're having a good old time. I mean, they're having a concert, they're singing, they're dancing, they're playing, they're eating, they're committing fornication, you know, they're doing all these various things to their new gods that they just made to themselves. Verse 19, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot. So now Moses is getting angry. So God's angry. We see, you know, he's pleading with God. God saw all this stuff going on. That's why God was so angry. Moses, there's a difference between hearing about it and seeing it. Just as much as there's a difference, you know, as, as think about how devastated you'd be if you heard about your spouse cheating on you or you heard about something like that as opposed to if you actually walked in on it. I mean, obviously, it's devastating either way, but like, you witness that and see that, you're going to, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm probably going to go through the roof, right? But watch out, because I'm armed. <laughs> and I've got guns almost everywhere in the house. So as like, I walk in on that, someone ain't leaving my house. And I'm not premeditating anything. I'm just saying, I see something like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip. I'm going to lose it. Just like God was losing it here with these people. And Moses lost it then when he saw him because he didn't see it. He was just hearing from God. Like, no, you know, God have mercy, you know, and he, he interceded for him. Then he gets down. And he's just like, what are you guys doing? You know, and, and he, he ends up, you know, throwing the, the, the tablets down and breaks the, the commandments and stuff. It says here, it says, the anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to power and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. So you're making these gods, you know, he burns it up, put it in the water here, drink this. Drink your stupid gods. And forced them to drink of it. Verse 21, and Moses said unto Aaron, what did these people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon thee? What are you doing, Aaron? And this fits in well with this morning's sermon. Why, why are you listening to these people, Aaron? Don't blame them. Why are you listening to them? Why don't you do what's right by God? Why do you have to participate in their sin and lead these people and bring so great? He says, thou hast brought so great a sin upon them. You can say, oh, but they asked for it. I'm just giving them what they asked for. Yeah, you brought it upon them. 
You're being held responsible, Aaron. It doesn't matter what they want. You don't go and, and sin against the Lord your God. I don't care if everybody wants it. Our job is not to be the preachers of the tickling ears. To just tell everyone what they want to hear. Our job is to be a messenger for the Lord and preach His words. And not out of our own heart or not to uh, satisfy what is in someone else's wicked heart. Verse 22, And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on me. You know them. It's their fault. You did it too, Aaron. Verse 23, For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it me, then I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. Now see, this just came out. And how stupid is that? To call, I mean, oh, we, we put some gold, we put it in a fire. Oh, look, this calf came out. Oh, it's, it must be God. We put metal in a fire, and, and this thing came out that looks like a calf. It must be God. How base, how, how stupid. And it really is. I mean, there, there is, that just goes so beyond any type of intellect at all. Oh, God, yeah, this is a piece of metal. Let me, let me, let me you know, throw some trash and some, you know, let's just see what comes out of the fire. What does this do when I throw it in the fire? Oh, that must be God. So dumb. Let's keep reading here, though. Verse 25, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Now, there's, there's also a lot of symbolism in the chat. I'm not going to get too deep into it. But the rejection of God, the making of their own gods, not wanting to be, not wanting to have rules, and then being naked. Now, we know that when we're saved, we're clothed, right, with a white garment. Like, and when we're naked, your shame's there. And if you don't have a garment, you don't have faith. You're not saved, right? I mean, there's a, this is symbolism. I'm not saying that all the people weren't saved or whatever. I'm just saying this symbolic reference here, talking about the people being naked. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's keep reading. Verse number 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay Every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. He's executing judgment within, I mean, within, their own, with, within the house of Israel. I mean, people are related to one another. He's saying, you're going to go through and, and, and right this wrong. And there's going to be justice, and the, and the only justice is killing the people. Killing all these people that just made up their, 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 their fake gods and rejected the Lord. This is how serious of a sin this is. And he's saying the only way we could even do anything about this is these people got to die. Who's on God's side? Who's on the Lord's side? Come over here. Stand by me. We're going to execute some judgment. Verse number 28. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. He said, you, love, you have to love God more than your own family and be willing to just to commit to the Lord. Verse number 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. He's saying, I'm going to go back to God now and, just, and try, to, try to make an atonement. Try, try to, to make you at one again with God. Try to make things reconciled with God because of your grievous sin. He's basically saying, like, I don't even know what I can do because this is such a big deal. Because this is such a big sin. Because you've rejected God. You've made your own God. I don't even know how I'm going to make this right. But I'm going to go back up and try to talk to God. Verse 31, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Now look at this. And, and don't skip over this. Verse number 32, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And then he just, just, just there's a dash there. Right, he doesn't even finish the sentence. He says, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. When someone gets blotted out of the book of life, that's when they become reprobate. Right. When they are just completely removed, there is no hope for you. 
And Moses, in his love and compassion, goes to God just saying, you know what, God? You know, please forgive these people. They've sinned. And he's saying, basically he's saying, if, if I can take their place, just, just blot my name. I'm willing to go to hell for these people. And this is obviously symbolic of Jesus Christ and the love that Jesus had to go and pay for our sins. And he's saying, you know what? Then just blot me. And, and, and God's saying, you know what? No, I'm not going to blot your name out. But those people that sin, I'm going to blot their name out. You don't get blotted out, but they do. Why? Because they're responsible. They're responsible for their own actions because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. We're almost, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you see how this ties together. And the idolatry goes hand in hand with Romans 1. Turn if you would to Deuteronomy 29 now. We're done in Exodus 32. Turn if you would to Deuteronomy 29. Because there's another passage that underscores how serious God is about this. God was so serious about this idolatry that he was willing to cast off all the people of Israel and start over with Moses. He was so serious about it. Moses was like, hey, you've got to kill every man and his brother. I mean, these people that were, that were caught up into this stuff, they're being put to death. And now I'm going to go back to God and, and try to sacrifice myself for you guys. And offer up myself as just saying, you know what, God, blot me out, send me to hell forever, and just please forgive them. That's the only thing he come up with at all to try to appease and satisfy God for what they had done and how serious the sin of idolatry is. And why over and over and over and over again we find, take heed, beware, don't get sucked up in idolatry, don't get caught up in any of these, you know, this false religion and, and rejecting God and creating your own gods. Watch out for it because it's so serious. Deuteronomy 29, look at verse number 18. Verse number 18, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Gall and wormwood is like poison, right? It's, 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 it's this corrupt, evil root. He said, I don't want this root to spring up in you where you turn away from the Lord and go to serve these false gods. And then this root bearing gall and wormwood, you know, evil fruit. This is talking about people becoming evil trees, right? This root forming of being a corrupt tree, bringing forth evil fruit, as opposed to a good tree that bringeth forth good fruit. The good fruit comes from the Lord, but when you reject the Lord and, and, and go after these other gods, you got to watch out that you don't have a root that, that bears down and bears gall and wormwood. And you become a, a corrupt tree bearing evil fruit. Verse number 19, and it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart. So this is talking about someone, again, to pay attention to, what, to, to what's being said here. And I know, I think, I'm pretty sure everyone here is familiar with the reprobate doctrine. It's knowing God and rejecting God. This is talking about someone, verse 19, and it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse about people being cursed by not obeying God, by not listening to God, by not following God, that he bless himself in his heart. He hears the curse and he blesses himself, saying, I shall have peace. Though I walk in the imagination, even though I walk in the imagination of my heart, even though I create my own gods, even though I do this, you know what? I'm blessing myself. Why? Because you have no respect for God. You've rejected God. You make a mockery of God. You hate God. And then he says to add drunkenness to thirst. You know what? I'm going to rise up and play. I'm going to go get drunk. I'm going to have a party. I'm going to go dance and have fun. And, and this is what my life's about because I've rejected God and I'm just going to do everything for me. And I don't care what that book says. I don't care what God says. I don't care what the Bible says. And you start blessing, he blesses himself in his heart. Look at verse 20. The Lord will not spare him. God's not going to show mercy. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. We see this concept and this doctrine taught throughout scripture. This is not some weird or strange doctrine, even though it's not being taught very widely today. But it is very scriptural. It is very biblical. We find this over and over again in the Bible. And, and it couldn't even be more clear, even in Deuteronomy 29. He's saying, look, 
People hear the curses. They have no regard for it. They make up their own, they, their, their, in, through their own imagination of their heart, they bless themselves and they go after whatever they want. And they say, you know what? I know it says I'm cursed, but I'm actually going to be blessed. I'm going to bless myself. Because there's no regard for the true God. Right. And you know what God does? Says, okay. That's the way you want it? I'll blot your name out forever. And they're blotted out. Verse number 21, And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant. That and you start reading, read Deuteronomy, read the curses. They're not good curses. That's why they're cursed for a reason. I mean, it's really bad. And he said, I'm going to add all those curses unto you. Verse 22, So that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath, even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. That's the cause. He said, when you go and reject God and serve other gods and you make yourself idols, you become reprobate. And he says, even the whole, he's saying the whole land, when people come and they see this and they're like, what in the world made God so angry? And he compares it to, guess what? Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Why? Because God rained fire and brimstone down upon those reprobate nations that rejected the Lord and they lived for themselves and they had abundance of idleness and abundance of bread and idleness and, and didn't care about other people and committed abominations and rejected God and we're reprobate, and God destroyed them so bad that he says, you're never going to be inhabited again. And when people see that, they ought to be asking, what would make God so angry to destroy this people just so intensely and, and just make sure they're just cursed forever? And he tells us, well, they went and served other gods, and they rejected me. That's a jealous God. It's a serious sin. Verse 27, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of the land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. So we're almost done. It's the last place we're going to have you turn tonight. Romans chapter 1. Because we want to tie it all together. We're going to start reading in verse number 18. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And look, this is the key. And, and a lot of people don't have a hard time understanding the reprobate doctrine and things like that. And who's a reprobate and who's not a reprobate. And what does this mean? And being rejected. The New Testament gives us, I think, the most clarity. We've seen this, and especially those who already understand the doctrine, we see this very clearly in the Old Testament. Amen. But the, the, the light, even in the New Testament, that, that helps us understand it even more fully, it, it matches up perfectly with everything that we already read. But the people that reject God and become idolatrous and set up their own gods, once they've made the rejection of the Lord, God rejects them. And, and I, let me be very clear about that. There is no hope of salvation for these people right. because God has blotted out their name from the book of life. They could never be added. It's gone. Right. It's gone. It doesn't get put back in. It's gone. They cannot be saved because they cannot believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because God hardens their heart. Right. God did it to Pharaoh. God's done it to other people. When people reject God and they, and they become idolatrous, that's it. It's over for them. 
just as much as it's over for everybody the day that they breathe their last breath, you have no more chances of salvation. You, Jesus doesn't appear to you after you die. You say, oh, but I've never heard of Jesus. You, you don't get this second chance. No, when you breathe your last breath, that's it. You've already had your last chance for salvation. Well, you know what? Some people, that line of, of when is their last chance for salvation happens before death. Because right. the word reprobate means rejected. It means they've been rejected by God. They push things too far. They've crossed a line. And look, God has a few lines that he says, you cross this, you're blotted out. This, these, these examples of this idolatry, rejecting the Lord, holding the truth in unrighteousness, they know the truth. It's not that they don't know the truth. They do know the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. They make a mockery of it. They bless themselves in their heart when they hear the curse of God. That's pretty bold. That's, that shows you, this is not just every unbeliever, as some might have you believe that Romans 1 is talking about. It's not every unbeliever. I was not making a mockery of God's word before I got saved. I'll tell you that much. Now, in some of my actions, I may have been, but I was not in my heart just blessing myself. So, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but what's the Bible anyways? And just making a mockery of God's word or anything like that. Look, I wasn't like that. So everyone isn't like that. And I'm not saying, you know, if you add some thought or at some point in your life, you know, that you can never be saved, but this is not, Romans 1 and these other places are not referring to just your average unbeliever. It's not. It's all about people who knew the truth and rejected it. Not everyone knows the truth. Not everyone here has heard the truth or under, has understood it. We go out soul winning, we try to give the gospel, but a lot of people don't even understand it. But when people understand it, they either don't make a decision, which is fine, that still doesn't reprobate them, but, but some people make a decision. They hear, they understand, they understand the gospel, they understand Jesus, they understand the curses, they understand hell, and they say, nope. Nope, I prefer my God. Nope, I'm going to make myself a God. I don't like that. And when they make that rejection, God says, I'm done with you. You've made your choice. You've had your opportunity. Gone. Done. This is serious. Idolatry is serious. We need to take heed that we don't allow anything. And look, I, you, it's not like you're going to lose your salvation, but when it's this serious, let's not have any type of idolatrous thoughts coming into our minds at all, or actions, or, or putting up anything that would get in the way of our relationship with God. Whether that be your wife, or your husband, or anything else. You know, God needs to be number one in your life. When we start putting other things, money, right? The Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. For either you love the one and hate the other, or you know, cleave the one and despise the other. You, you can't serve them both. You can't, put, you can't have your heart set on finances and then expect your heart to be on God. It's one or the other. We need to make the choice. So that leads you to you know, the, 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 the covetousness of money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, which again goes hand in hand with this idolatrous attitude of making your own gods or being covetous or wanting something else. And, and the wickedness and evil and how serious it is. We, we need to stay as far away from this as possible. Let's finish in Romans 1, though. Verse number um, 18. We'll read that again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. God made them see it. He opened up their eyes. He enlightened them. As Hebrews 6 says, they, 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 they've tasted that heavenly gift. They understood it. They, they, they know about it. God showed it unto them. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. God made us. He made his creation capable of understanding who he is and understanding the gospel, understanding everything. He's made us that way. It's evident. He said he's given us opportunity. He's, he's, he's made it. He's made uh, the creation being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. No one has an excuse. Right. Nobody in this world has an excuse to not get saved. That's right. 
Because that when they knew God, again, there's the key. They knew God. God's not just reprobating people at random. He said, these are people that knew God. Not someone else's false version of God. They knew God. They glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Remember, that word imagination was used already in Deuteronomy. Their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. The light went out. They're, they're, they're cold. Their conscience becomes seared. The foolish heart is darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory. Look at this. The glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creepy things. That's your idolatry. Do you see how this idolatry is just tied in almost everywhere we look with being a reprobate? When people create these false gods and just cleave to them, they know the Lord, but they reject him and go after these false gods, they're reprobate. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That golden calf, that calf represented a creature of God, a creation. God made cows. God made calves. And they're worshiping and serving this creation that God made above God or in the place of God. God, the creator, they're going to take one of his creation to say, oh, no, this is God. Backwards. This is the idolatry after knowing who God is, rejecting him and choosing your own way. Take heed. Take heed about this idolatry. Like I was just saying, you're saved. You can't be unsaved. God's not going to blot your name out because you've already, just like he said to Moses, you know what? No. They that have sinned, they that have rejected me. They're the ones that are going to, that are blotted out. You're not. But seeing how serious this is and seeing the impact our life has on other people and the testimony that we carry, let's stay as far away from this as possible. Anything that's idolatrous, anything that's going to come up in your life that might get between you and God, anything at all, whatever that is. It doesn't have to be a physical object. Don't have the physical objects in your house, by the way. They're idols. These, these gra you know, a, a graven image. Graven means it's covered with gold or silver. Carved, right? Carved from what don't have. You know, and I don't care. You say, oh, it's harmless. I saw it in a souvenir shop or a gift shop. Do you really want to, you know, tempt God in that way? You may think it's harmless, but I, I don't know about you, but look, even if it was okay, which I don't think it is, I wouldn't want to get close to that. We see the stern warnings. Let's just keep it far away from us. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching from Scripture. Lord, I pray that you please help us to identify idolatry and to, to root it out. And Lord, um, you know, especially, you know, we may be saved, but we may have children that, that haven't put their faith in you yet, dear Lord, and keeping idols around and, and things like that is going to cause confusion. And we don't know what it's going to do to their hearts, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to clean up our homes, to clean up our lives, and to, and to warn others, God, about, about how serious idolatry is and how serious of a sin this is and that this causes people to... Um, to become rejected and reprobate from you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.